to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim the news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ if any man suffers as a christian let him not be ashamed but let him glorify God in this name. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 16. Welcome to our study of the book of 1 Peter. In this second lesson, in chapters 3 through 5, now we're going to notice our responsibility as a Christian toward others. In chapters 3 through 5, Peter is going to show by inspiration that the child of God has a responsibility to various other people, including himself and God. He begins in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1 by showing the Christian mate's responsibility to an unbelieving mate. What if I'm a child of God and I'm married and I have a wife or if someone has a husband who's not a Christian, how do you win that person to the Lord? Well, you first have to try to teach them the Word. Notice 1 Peter 3, verse 1, the Bible says, Wives, likewise be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they, without a word, may be won by the conduct of their wives. Let's realize that first you've got to try to teach them. It's evident in this context, somebody tried to teach this man the word. He wasn't won by it, but somebody tried to teach it to him. Friends, if we're going to win lost people to Christ, we've got to teach them the gospel. This is what Jesus told us to do. Matthew 28, verse 18, Jesus said, You go into all the world and preach the gospel unto every creature. Now, at the preaching of the word, the individual soul is responsible for obedience to it. Some obeyed in the New Testament, some did not. Mark chapter 10, Jesus spoke very plainly to the rich young ruler, and he went away sorrowful, because he had great riches. Yet in Acts chapter 8, Philip preached the gospel to the people of Samaria, Simon being included, and they obeyed the gospel. Some may be won by the word, some's heart are not ready yet. In the context, there is a Christian woman whose husband has been taught the word, and he doesn't obey that. Well, what then? What is her responsibility to her husband. How does the Christian wife or the Christian mate win a non-believing mate to the Lord? Well, once they've taught the Word, been taught the Word, and they reject that, there's still an avenue by which you can win them to Jesus. Now, I understand at every opportunity, you need to try to encourage them, you need to look for opportunities to teach them. You don't need to give up trying to teach the Word, but what else can you do if their heart is hardened against the Word? The wife, it says in 1 Peter 3, verse 2 following, will win her husband by her Christian conduct. Notice 1 Peter 3, verses 2 through 6. The Bible says, When they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear, they may be won. Verse 3, Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. For in this manner, in former times, holy women trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are, if you do good and not afraid with any terror. Well, how are you going to win that unbelieving mate once, he, once you've tried to teach him the word? You've got to win him, and you will win him by Christian character. What's that mean? You've got to be the type of Christian he needs to see. If, if your mate is not a Christian, friend, you desperately at every opportunity need to be an exemplar example, exemplar identification of what a Christian is. You need to have chaste and reverent conduct. That is a conduct that's godly, a conduct that shows reverence for holy things, a conduct that represents the teaching of the Bible. You need to have reverence for God in every area. You know what's so sad sometimes? 
is a Christian, will try to convert someone who's not a Christian, maybe a mate, and they want them to learn the gospel, they want them to become a child of God, and yet sometimes in the home, that unbelieving mate sees them doing things or acting in ways that are not right. For example, maybe their dress is, all, is not what it ought to be according to Scripture. If you're going to win your mate to the Lord in every area of life, You've got to be an example of what a Christian is. Don't be focused on physical appearance and worldliness. Don't, don't let it be the adorning of the body that's the most important thing to you. Rather, the hidden and inner beauty of the heart. What's on the inside? They need to see what Christianity has done for your life, how it's changed who you are. And you also need to be a submissive mate. You still have to submit to the teaching of God on the home, even if your mate is not a Christian. Now, I understand that you've got to submit in the Lord. As he is doing things that are in accord with God's teaching, your responsibility is to be submissive. If he up and says, well, I'm just going to leave the church and you're going to go with me, submission doesn't go to that point. You've got to submit to Him as He is, even though He may not be a Christian, doing things that are right in the sight of God. And so be submissive. Be focused on the inner person and you be the best example of what a Christian is. Here's what that means. In your speech, don't let worldly speech, ungodly language ever come off your lips. Control your anger. Address in a modest and appropriate way. Every time the doors are open, regardless of whether family's in, regardless of whether it's easy or not, you make it all the more your aim to be there. Study your Bible at home. Let Him see you doing that. Be happy and cheerful and joyful as a Christian ought to be. That's how you're going to win a mate who is not a child of God and who will not listen to the Word. And husbands, you, the Bible says, are to be understanding with your wife. Look in uh, verse 7 of 1 Peter 3. Notice what the command is for husbands. Just as Sarah obeyed her husband, husbands, verse 7, likewise dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. There is a responsibility in marriage. The wife is to submit. The husband is the head of the home. He is the decision maker along with the taking in what everybody else has to say and what the Bible says. He's the head of the home. There's no doubt about that. But how is he to relate to everybody in the family toward the wife? He is to be understanding. Husbands have not been placed in the home as dictators whose will and wishes must be obeyed regardless of what anybody else thinks or feels. They're to be understanding. Ephesians 5, 21 through 31. Husbands as head of the home are to love their wives as their self. They're to be willing to give their life for them. They're to be the provider and protector of the home. That means they must bring into consideration what others think and their feelings on the matter. Now, how important is this? Someone says, well, that's all good and well, but is that really essential to me being, is my responsibility and relationship in the home essential to being a faithful Christian? You'll notice verse 7 says it is. The failure to be a good and understanding husband and no doubt the failure to be a submissive, good Christian example as a wife will cause you to be severed in your relationship with God. Verse 7 says, If wives, if husbands are not understanding with their wives, even their prayers are hindered. This is a matter of right and wrong. This is a matter of sin and righteousness. If we're not understanding like we ought to be, we've severed our relationship with God. Psalm 66 verse 18 teaches it has to be that way. For God cannot hear the prayer of someone who remains in sin or iniquity. God's ears are closed toward that. And so we must have the proper relationship and responsibility in the home. Here's what we've got to ask ourselves. As husbands, are we being as understanding as we can? Or sometimes do we fly off the handle when things don't go our way? Sometimes when everybody doesn't like things the way I like them, do I get angry and take it out on everybody in the home? And as wives, are you being submissive to your husband as Sarah obeyed Abraham calling him Lord whose daughters you are friends we're not talking about a dictatorship again but there is a divine arrangement for the home God has placed man as the head of the home and wives are to be submissive to their own husbands do you think sometimes I better take the lead because I've got better ideas and better ways 
Friend, that's an attitude that's not in accord with the teaching of the Bible. Yes, you work together. Yes, your grace, uh, you're heirs of the grace of life together. You're a helpmate for Him, but you've got to see the divine arrangement and follow it. Now, in 1 Peter chapter 3, Peter also talks about another relationship we have, and this is the relationship to lost people in the world. What's to be my relationship toward those who are outside of Christ? I'm to be ready always. 1 Peter 3 verse 15 says, Be ready always to give an answer for the reason of the hope that is within you with meekness and with fear. I sanctify God in my heart. I set Him apart. And as a result, I'm ready to tell others about Jesus. That's my responsibility to the lost. You know, to be ready, you've got to get ready. 2 Timothy 2 verse 15 says, We've got to study to show ourselves approved unto God. We've got to search the Scriptures daily. Acts 17, 11. Oh, how I love the example of Ezra. Ezra prepared his heart, there was his readiness, to seek the law of the Lord, to do it, and to teach its statutes in all Israel. Ezra 7, verse 10. And so our responsibility is to get ready, to be ready, and to tell others about the gospel, of the reason of the hope that is within you with meekness and fear. Can you tell people of the world why you have hope? Can you tell them how they can get hope? I've got hope because of what Jesus did for me at Calvary. Because He gave His life as a sacrifice, I can live through Him. And friend, can you tell anybody how to get that hope? And we're not talking about being ready for everything. We're not talking about being ready to tell somebody about the baptism of the dead or 70 weeks in Daniel or the four horsemen of Revelation. That's not the context here. Be ready what? Be ready always to give an answer for the reason of the hope that's within you. Someone says, why is your life so happy? What kind of hope do you have? Can you tell them about the hope of Jesus and the plan of salvation? Friend, if you can't, then you haven't been reminded of the need to get ready to tell others about the gospel and you desperately need to study your Bible. Now, just like those on the ark were saved dealing with that hope, just like the eight souls on the ark were saved with water, so men and women today are saved in the waters of baptism. This is a clear teaching. He brings up the example of Noah. And as the ark, the waters, the water lifted up the ark and the people were saved, found safety in the ark, so today men and women are saved through baptism. I, I talk to people at times and people say, well, yeah, baptism is something you ought to do, but it's something you do after you're saved. Yes, you ought to be saved and then be identified by being baptized later. Friend, that's not what the Bible says in baptism. And you won't find a clearer verse than 1 Peter 3.21. Someone says, show me a verse in the Bible that says baptism saves and I'll do it. Here it is. Look in 1 Peter 3 verse 21. The scripture clearly says, there is also an antitype which now saves us. Baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We need to realize our responsibility toward baptism. I've got to do what God says concerning baptism to be safe. Was the water essential in their salvation in the ark? You bet it was. The water lifted the ark and the rest of the world that was drowned, that was lost because of that, that same water lifted up the ark and saved the people in the days of Noah. Friend, baptism doth now also save us. How could God make it any clearer that you can't be saved until you obey God in baptism? Baptism is not something that occurs on the past side of salvation. It's something you've got to do in the present to be saved. The Bible teaches this in multiple passages. Listen to these passages. On the great day of Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, when they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? The answer was this. Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Why? For the remission of sins. Baptism is the point in time in which Sins are remitted. Acts 22, 16 teaches this. Saul was told in Acts 9, 6, you go in the city, it'll be told you what you must do. As he gets there and Ananias comes to him, Acts 22, 16, Ananias says, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. At what point in time in salvation are sins washed away? Sin separates us from God. So if we can know that point in time, we can know exactly when salvation occurs. Arise be baptized, 
wash away your sins. You know, Jesus said it plainly. Mark 16, verse 16, Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. Jesus said two conditions. Belief and baptism are both essential to salvation. Are you saying today then that we can't get to heaven without being baptized? That's what Jesus said. John 3 verse 5, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, unless, if and only if, unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. You can't be a part of God's kingdom here and the kingdom that's going to the Father 1 Corinthians 15, 24, unless you obey what God says concerning baptism. Friend, I want you to see the essentiality of it today. Think about this principle. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, the Bible says all spiritual blessings are in Christ. One of those blessings, according to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 10 through 12, is salvation. Salvation's in Christ. And so you've got all spiritual blessings in Christ, salvation's in Christ, I therefore have to be in Christ to be saved. How do you get into Christ? Only one way in the Bible. Galatians 3.27 says, As many of us as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. If salvation's in Christ, if all spiritual blessings are in Christ, and if the only way I can get in Christ in Scripture is by baptism, how dare we say it's not essential to God and it's not essential to my salvation. God said it is. And you can't be right with God until you've obeyed that. Now, let me make it as plain and clear as we can. Friend, this means that if someone taught you that baptism was something good to do and you did it after you thought you were saved, you're still not saved. You are lost in sin and you've not obeyed God's will yet. You say, well, I was baptized. You had no clue why. John 8, verse 32, at least it wasn't a biblical reason. John 8, verse 32, Jesus said, you've got to know the truth and then the truth will make you free. You may have gotten wet, but you didn't know what God taught about baptism and that had no effect on your soul because you did it for reasons that were not right according to the Scripture. So let's understand our responsibility, relationship toward baptism. Let's also understand that Christians have a responsibility toward suffering. The Bible says Christians will suffer persecution. First Peter 4 verse 1, Peter clearly says we're going to have to face difficulty and persecution because of our belief. Notice what he says in chapter 4 verse 1. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Christ suffered in the flesh, and the Bible says you arm yourself with that same mind. What mind? That I'm going to have to suffer in this life. Suffering is something we're all going to have to face for Jesus. If not, if we're not suffering, the Bible says we're not being faithful. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. 2 Timothy 3, verse 12. Paul, after it had rocks bounced off his head, he was stoned and left for dead, he arose and said, We must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. Acts 14, verse 22. Peter said earlier in chapter 2, verse 21, that we're to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. What footsteps in context? The footsteps of suffering, being reviled, being slandered, and not sinning back. James 1, 2 says that suffering, though, is not a bad thing. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. And so we're going to have to suffer. We're going to have to be a part of that if we're going to be faithful to Jesus. Also, what today is our relationship toward the immoral practices of this world. Our relationship toward that, our responsibility toward them, is that Christians cannot get involved in that. Look in chapter 4, verse 3, and notice what Peter says we've got to stay away from. Peter says, We have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lewdness, listen, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. My responsibility now toward those things is to stay away from them. We spent enough of our time in that. Let's get out of it. Listen to what he says, lewdness. This is a sexual excess that often results in indecent behavior. Behaving in a way that is lewd, that's immodest, that's sexually tempting, doing things that are immoral and ungodly with your body, that's against the will of God. Lust, just the basic lack of self-control over the flesh. The lust of the flesh, whether it be 
sexual, whether it relate to things like gluttony, gluttony be a lust of the flesh, whether it relate to things like alcohol or tobacco or things of that nature, we've got to stay away from that. Drunkenness, he says, which in context is excessive drinking here, being drunk, habitual intoxication. Of course, Christian wouldn't want to be involved in alcohol at all. Proverbs 20 verse 1 says, Wine is a mocker and strong drink is a brawler. Whoever's led astray by it is not wise. But notice also revelries, drinking parties, all those things a Christian must not have a relationship with those anymore. Rather, we're to have a proper relationship with the Word of God. If any man speaks, Peter says, 1 Peter 4 verse 11, let him speak as the oracles of God. My responsibility toward the Word of God is to live my life to say what the Bible says. 2 Timothy 4 verse 2, we're to preach the Word. God said to Jonah, you preach the preaching that I bid you. That's what we need today. We need more men who will take up the banner of Titus 2.1. As for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. And friends, as we speak what the Word of God says, we need to do it without being ashamed. Look at the beautiful teaching of 1 Peter 4, verse 16. Notice what the Scripture says. If anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this name. As we live properly and view the world, as we abstain from ungodly things, as we say what God says, we've got to not be ashamed of being a Christian. Romans 1, 16, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God. Friends, I imagine as Peter penned these words that they were very near and dear to his heart. Do you remember the latter part of Matthew 26? Peter said, Lord, if all are made to depart from you today, I'll never, I'll never depart. And Jesus said, yes, you will. And Peter, when he was asked as he was standing there in the courtyard, aren't you one of his? No, not I. Are you sure you're not one of his? Oh, no, not me. Are you sure you're sure? And he began to swear and to curse. I don't know the man. Peter was ashamed of being a Christian at that point. At least he was fearful. And so he writes to us now and he says, don't be like me. You grow. You, you realize not to be ashamed is greater than anything in the world. Jesus has never been ashamed of us. He's not ashamed to call us his children. Hebrews 2 verse 11. He wasn't ashamed to suffer. To, to, he looked toward the joy of the cross, Hebrews 12, verse 1, and as a result, we should never be ashamed of Him. If someone says you're a Christian, don't, don't blush and say, well, yeah, I am. No, you stand up and say, I'm glad to be a Christian. You want to know how to be one? I'll stand up for Jesus and do what He says, will you? We need to have the proper relationship toward being a Christian. But also, we need to realize our relationship toward leaders in the Lord's church. Look in 1 Peter chapter 5. Peter himself was an elder, and now he's going to tell us what our relationship toward the leadership in the church is. 1 Peter 5, notice what Peter says. The elders who are among you I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the suffering of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. He says, shepherd the flock of God which is among you serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, not as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you receive the crown of glory, which does not fade away. Then he goes on to verse 5 to say, you younger people be submissive to the elders. Our responsibility toward the leaders of the church is to be submissive. Now, I understand Jesus has all authority in matters of doctrine. Matthew 28, verse 18 clearly teaches that. I'm going to be judged by the Word of God. The Bible teaches in John 12, 48, but in ways to enact that in the teaching of the church, in the teaching of Bible classes and worship times and, and works that have been set forth, I've got to be obedient. Hebrews 13, 17, Obey those who are over you, submit to them, they watch out for your souls. Now, here's a practical lesson to learn. Was Peter the first pope? I want you to think about it now. Many people say he was, but 1 Peter 5 and Matthew 8, 14 clearly teach he wasn't. Peter was not a pope. He did not lead the first celibate life, and he is not the head of the Roman church. Jesus is the head of the church, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. Peter had a mother-in-law, Matthew 8, 14, which meant he had a wife, and Peter had children. You say, how do you know that? Peter was an elder. What's the qualification of an elder? 
1 Timothy 3, verse 1 following, he must have faithful children. He must have a wife who will help him in that work. And so Peter was not an elder, but elders do have responsibility. They are to exhort, and they are to shepherd the flock of God. They're not leaders. Rather, they're to be exam they're not they're not to be lords, they're to be leaders, they're to be examples, and they're to help people in their journey toward heaven, realizing they'll give an account of people's souls. Now we have another responsibility that we need to think about for just a moment, and that's our responsibility toward human pride. What is our responsibility toward our ego and toward our pride? It causes so many people problems today, but what does the Bible say? Look in 1 Peter chapter 5 and notice verse 6. The Scripture says, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time. God had already said, God resists the proud, gives grace to the humble. Therefore, you humble yourselves in the sight of God, and He'll lift you up. My responsibility toward pride, human pride and ego is to put it aside, to humble myself. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and He'll lift you up. James chapter 4 verse 6. Realize that pride is one of those things that if we're not careful, will cause us to be lost. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before fall. Therefore, we've got to cast all our cares on the Lord. He cares for us. We've got to realize the devil is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, but you can resist him steadfast in the faith. And so when it comes to my responsibilities, I've got to make sure that I put the kingdom first and that I do what God says. Friend, there's no greater joy in all the world than being a child of God. The Christian name is the greatest name you could ever wear. We ask you today, are you a child of God? Have you obeyed the gospel? Are you sure you're right with God? Remember, Acts chapter 2, verse 38 says you've got to repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Once you do that, you've got to live faithful to Jesus, be faithful unto death, and then you'll receive the crown of life. As a Christian, if you are one, have you been living toward your responsibility, with your responsibility in a proper way? Remember, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but rather let him glorify God in this name. May you make it your aim to glorify God in everything you do. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, high, not your wife. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. God be the glory. This is the gospel of Christ.